Hi, I'm John Hamilton. We're here from Christ Church, and we're in the second part of our mini series on participation. And so the first talk a week ago, I talked about a red circle and a green circle. And I was trying to emphasize what happens in a group of people when a crisis comes and sort of explodes in the midst. You jump and you take a little step forward and the group of people that are oriented towards themselves and being independent, it's like a circle of people that are looking outward. So when they take that step, they move away and they get separated and they spread apart. And so it's a move towards isolation. Independence takes us towards isolation. And the group of people that are looking after each other, looking towards the inside in the green circle, they take that little jump that the crisis causes and a little step forward, and they find that they're closer together and they're better prepared to help each other. And so the illustration is limited because to grow, we need to be looking outwards, we need to be including people. So a, a healthy circle is always expanding. But the idea is not so much the circle, but our attitude towards other people, our disposition and uh, being other centered, which enables us to help and to be helped. And so the point is to learn about me, to remember and realize I can only change me. I can't change you. And so I'm working on me so that I can be a better friend and family member and colleague to anyone in any kind of a crisis. And so we talked about the crisis that affected Jesus' disciples. When the Roman soldiers came and they took Jesus away, they tortured him, they crucified him, he died. The disciples, the closest disciples, uh, mostly men, the story tells us about, fled in fear. Almost all of them betrayed him in some way or another, their friendship, their loyalty, and they were, they were discouraged. They were hiding. They were terrified. Uh, someone in our group pointed out that actually the women were present at the cross. The women were the first one to the tomb. And so some of the women actually responded, uh, were much more capable of responding well in the crisis than the men that we read about, and that's certainly true. But Jesus rose again, and he rose, came back to life against <laughs> all the science and the magic and the expectations that anybody could have. Because who comes back from the dead? But Jesus did. But even when he did, we see that they've lost some of their inner fire. That difficult time of loss and grief really hurt them. And so the Gospel of John shows that even after having met with Jesus, they are they get together. They, at first they split up and spread out, but they get back together to process what's happened perhaps, the loss, the grief. But when they get together, they're far from the city, they're far from the temple, they're far from the people. They're actually in a boat on the lake fishing. Instead of moving forward, they're stuck in their grief, in their loss. And as many of us tend to do, they'd gone back to what they already knew. Now that raises an interesting question. And that is, what do we do? What do I do? What do you do when there's a crisis and the initial adrenaline wears off? How did people react in your family of origin? How did your parents respond to a crisis? Your aunts and uncles, your grandparents. Is your reaction from your family from your culture? Or is it something that you learned and decided to do? Where does your response to crisis come from? Now, Acts 1 and 2 gives a great short story about how the disciples began to recover their inner fire, their passion, their purpose, and mission in life. And I suggested that you would read chapters 1 to 4, even of the book of Acts. It's a great story. So I want to skip ahead to chapter 3 and the first 10 verses. It begins like this. One day, chapter 3, verse 1, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now, as I read this, I want you to be thinking, 
what has happened in the lives of Peter and John? They're the, they're the protagonists in this story. What has happened? What changes have taken place? So one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now, I want to point out a couple of things from this story about Peter and John. First of all, they are walking together. They're not alone. They're together. Now, they're applying, in my mind, the text from Ecclesiastes that I mentioned last week, where it says, two are better than one, because if one falls, he has a friend to help him up. And three is better than two. Jesus expanded on this teaching of Solomon from Ecclesiastes when he said, where two or three are united together or gathered together in my name, I promise to be with them. Now, you know that the greatest promise of God is his presence with us. And so now Peter and John are walking together, not isolated, not alone, together with the confidence that they are also accompanied by Jesus. And so they're walking together. And secondly, they are going without fear to the temple. Now remember, the temple is where the, the bad guys are that <laughs> had Jesus crucified, and they hated Jesus, and so certainly the disciples as well. But they're going there without fear. Now, later in life, John will write, perfect love displaces fear. In other words, when we trust God fully, we experience his presence, and the anxiety no longer will overwhelm us. So many times I have allowed my fears and my anxieties to influence my decisions. Anxieties are normal and some anxieties require professional help or medication to relate to, but I'm not referring to that. I'm talking about our inner fears and, and anxieties that motivate us to take decisions. And when we're motivated by fear to take or make decisions, then that's always wrong. That's always wrong. The fear causes us to manipulate, to control, to overprotect, to be anxious, to lose our peace, and to multiply fear in the lives of other people. So I want to ask, are there places in your life where you're afraid to go? And I don't mean just geographically, but I mean, are there places you can name why do they give you fear or anxiety? Can you make a list one at a time and identify why that causes me anxiety? For example, are you afraid to feel your emotions? Why? Are you afraid to speak to some family member or colleague? I've had all these fears. That's why I'm facing them in my life and asking you the same questions. It can be very liberating. Does it give you anxiety to face your financial reality? Does it give you anxiety or fear to look into your past, your memories, in order to understand the present? So Peter and John went together. 
They're headed to the temple without fear. And now thirdly, they're participating in reality with confidence. They don't ignore the problem that presents itself to them. They look directly at the problem in front of them with compassion, with confidence. They confess their, their weakness with transparency. They're saying, you need money. We don't have any money. But they're offering their truth with love. That's an attitude that's so attractive, we should imitate it. Now in the temple are the hateful, powerful leaders. And let's let them be a metaphor for the problems and difficulties that we face in our life. Think of it that way. Peter and John before hid from the temple, but now they're on their way to face it, to visit it. And so instead of hiding and running from the ugly realities, they decide to participate together in the process and learn and grow and they head out in spite of life's uncertainties and cruelties. They go with their confidence put in Jesus. It's interesting that to face their fears, the place they choose to go is prayer with the community. Now I'm interested that they are thinking apparently that the most important thing they have in front of them that afternoon is to go up to the temple and pray with the people. But God is actually preparing something else along the way. And that's a reality about how God works. I can be thinking that or planning to do something, but meanwhile, God is working and planning for something else. That something else in this case is the crippled beggar. And you remember the story, the, the parable of the, the Good Samaritan? Jesus had told it to the disciples and the people that were passing by, some were on their way to pray even, and they didn't stop according to Jesus. But a Samaritan passed by and he saw the person who had been beaten and robbed and he stopped to help him. He did the right thing, said Jesus. Well, perhaps Peter and John were remembering that story. And so they decide to stop and to help. But they have a dilemma. It's because in the story of the Good Samaritan, this Good Samaritan had given medicine, then he'd made hotel reservations, and then he'd gone and paid for all the expenses of the man. And Peter and John are just, they're, they're um, a couple of fishermen without work. Peter explains, look, I don't have any money. And almost impulsively, he remembers, hey, Jesus is with us. And he says to this uh, crippled beggar, in the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. And the guy gets up and he walks and he's jumping and he's shouting hallelujah to God. And everyone there sees it and they're filled with amazement and uh, surprise. So Acts 3 verses 11 and 12 say, While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people around, there were many people in the temple courts, they're amazed, astonished, and they come running to them in a place called Solomon's Colonnade. And when Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? Do you see Peter's humility? Compare that with when he was in the garden and he was determined to be the leader and teach Jesus what he could and couldn't do and to defend Jesus. And then he denied Jesus and yet here he is saying, the only one here who can do anything is Jesus. Do you see the transformation happening in his life? And that process can happen in our life as well. A green circle is a circle that grows and keeps growing to include anyone and everyone who wants to participate. In this way, the look, the outlook of the person is outside and inside. It's caring for people. It's being other centered. No healthy circle is ever closed. In fact, the most basic truth of the gospel is that Jesus showed the example and he invites us to go out and look for and help the people who need it. And so Acts chapter four, Peter gives a great speech. He's talking to the people. It's an amazing time. And so you can go read the rest of chapter three because I don't wanna focus on what Peter's doing. I wanna focus on how the people are 
seeing Peter and responding to him. So let's go to chapter 4 and verses 1 to 7. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John. The Sadducees are a powerful ruling elite of that time. And there also happen to be people who don't believe in the resurrection. They come up to Peter and John while they're speaking to the people and they're greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And they seized Peter and John and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men, just counting the men who believed, grew to about 5,000. So verse 5 says, The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. And they had Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all the members of the high priest's family. And so all the powerful, controlling, hateful people are there, the religious leaders. And they had Peter and John brought before them, and they began to question them, to interrogate them. And they said, by what power, or what name do you do this? And Peter gives a great answer, but you have to go read that text for yourself because I don't want to focus on what Peter said and did, but see how the others respond to him. And verse 13 says, When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled or untrained, doesn't mean they were illiterate, but they were untrained in, in, in public speaking kind of skills, unschooled ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Now we could spend time analyzing the speech that Pedro made, the words that he gave, or the many times that John uh, or Luke, the writer, explains how Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. And so our human tendency is to look at Peter like the people looked at him and see the miracle, or look at him like the the elders and the priests saw him. They saw this event as something extraordinary, uh, strange, inexplicable, uh, unexplainable, but they didn't consider the implications for their own life. And I'm wondering, are there implications for our life? Is there an implication or an application for my life? I say yes. These stories are clearly showing a before and an after in the lives of Peter and John. Their lives have really been transformed. The fear has been transformed into love. The tendency to go isolate in the lake that they know, in the comfort of their boat, has been transformed into, I'll go visit the most difficult place in my life, the temple for them, and part, I will participate in the needs of other people. And so the reaction of the people in the temple of wonder and amazement is really because of the miracle of seeing the, the lame man walk. But the reaction of the authorities who meet with Peter and John to interrogate them after they've thrown them in jail for the night, their reaction is because they recognize, writes Luke, that these men had been with Jesus. That's amazing. And so I ask, what do you want with your life? What kind of a legacy do you hope to leave? I want my life to be one more evidence of the resurrection of Jesus. Transformation is possible. Like Peter and John, Mary and Martha, Thomas and Philip, and so many more. I want that when people know me, when they investigate my life, when they question and examine, that they can only come up with one conclusion. This man has been with Jesus. Let's pray. And if you feel this prayer in your heart, then repeat it in your heart as I pray. Lord Jesus, help me to see you, to know you. I'm willing to change, to walk, to be part of your circle. Help me to understand. 
Forgive me for wanting to live life my way and depend on my strength. Help me to live trusting in you. I want to be transformed. Come to my life. Come to our lives. Let our church, our community, be a, a green circle that's always growing. Hear our hearts, our petition, our prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.